to determine your location. There. Oh, right. But well, anyway, this, uh, this is this yeah. is also something I remember from Battlestar Galactica, so uh, it may not be as accurate. <laughs> But once given a circle, then the idea is to perform an inversion of the space to swap inside and outside. And by placing several circles and then doing inversions about them in sequence, you, I think you would get a kaleidoscope effect. This is the kind of thing that's yeah. well possible to do even now, but it's about the fluidity of it. The claim people have made is that Apple's VR is about as fluid as an iPhone. And if that's even half true, I'll be very impressed. I mean, it's more, I was more talking about sort of the entire yeah. comfort of having it on your head, you know, that's... Yeah, that part's just uh, awkward as hell, so... Yeah, well, again, so... And hurts. Well, not hurts, but so I've I've seen sort of pretty good VR, but I, I mean, yeah, uh, I'll just try them one day, you know, I mean, I'm not going to buy one. That's for sure. I have to save up for this one. <laughs> I mean, so for example, um, so I've I've so I've had this VR goggles that you ride on a Peloton bike, right? Uh huh. And that's pretty cool, actually. I mean, sort of, you really get the feeling you're driving around, and because you sort of you sit still. Uh, so the only time you sort of get seasick, at least I, is when you take off the goggles again. Then it's sort of like two seconds, like whoa, what just happened? But so the entire process was totally smooth. And yeah, it's just fun cycling. And oh, look at that, the Alps. Uh, again, the resolution isn't, it's more like a video game than reality. So uh, Apple will really have, I mean, the thing costs like four or five K, I guess. About four K. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's, the resolution really has to be jacked up a lot before you, you really believe it. So, I mean, I got the feeling I was driving through a video game, which was pretty impressive. I'll let you know how that is. Yeah. And this Apple, this is the reason it's so expensive because they put basically two 4K monitors on postage stamps. That part is genuinely impressive. Yeah. Still though, 4K resolution. Okay. I mean, you, you, to... you'll see, you'll see, you need that. It's, it's not going to be overwhelming, I think. Like, uh, you'll see. Getting into this, though, here's a question I have personally, which is not about non-standard analysis, although that will come up quite soon. Give me like a two-minute introduction to reverse mathematics. All I know about it, and I imagine the audience, because there's not that many people that watch math podcasts, would know about it as just its goal, but not anything beyond that, really. Right, so... Um, let's say more than a hundred years ago, Semelo introduced uh, the axiom of choice, and a lot of people started looking into this. And one of the, I mean, there's a big history, but one of the remarkable things is that the axiom of choice and its fragments have many equivalent formulations. Mm -hmm. So people looked at the work of Borel, Baer, etc., and they found many equivalent formulations and then of course you wonder well is this always true is this sort of the natural state of axioms like we have an axiom and there's lots of equivalent formulations that was the motivation of reverse math and in a sense also the goal to show like once you have a natural theorem with natural axioms that prove it you have these long strings of many equivalences algebra topology analysis number theory all equivalent. So reverse math shows, yeah, sure, for many theorems, or most of them, this is the natural state of being. One idea in math can be reformulated into theorems in many of its subfields. And it started with the axiom of choice 100 years ago. And now well, people have been doing it for yeah, sequential compactness, transfinite recursion, that sort of stuff. And that's what reverse math is about, really. So, yeah, equivalences and uh, surprises to some extent, you know? Okay, what surprises? I'm especially that... interested if there are any personal surprises. 
Well, to me, it was sort of what was surprising is the the uncountability of the reels. So people had these uh, four systems that had many equivalences, and Dakhe and I, Dak Norman and I, discovered four new ones. And one of them is the uncountability of the reels. Like one of the most fundamental facts of mathematical life, in my modest yeah. opinion. And that's equivalent to many basic theorems about uh, functions of bounded variation, which is sort of Fourier analysis mm -hmm. and all that. And that that was just uh, a this, this surprise. As, as I told you, like one thing is set theory and it, you know, accountability of the reals. The other thing is your uh, basic Fourier analysis. So, and they're equivalent and uh, there's many. Also like the work of Volterra, Thing, like like stuff you get in the monthly, like there cannot be a function that's continuous on the rationals and discontinuous on the irrationals. It's mm -hmm. very basic facts, and yeah, they're equivalent somehow. I'm looking at your paper with Dag right now, actually. There's a couple, but <laughs> it just says on the uncountability of oh god damn, that's on research gate. My earnest request is Try to get stuff on archive as the Google it Scholar the link. If it's in your power. It's it's okay. all on the archive. I mean, I'll send you the link. Wait a second. Thanks. Uh, okay. Here's one on the computational properties of the uncountability of the real numbers by Sam Sanders. No, I'll send you the the link in the chat. So this is the okay. one I was talking about. Um, Where did the chat go? Oh, there we go. Got so it. this one, you you have lots and lots of equivalences for the uncountability of the real, let's say. Uh, yeah, including very basic stuff. This is interesting. The usual definition of accountable set does not seem suitable for reverse math style study of mainstream Exactly. Math. But this this is not this is not unheard of. Like in uh, in reverse math itself, they at first they went with Dedekind real numbers, uh -huh. and that worked for a while until they realized, damn, there's st structural problems if we work with Dedekind reals. So they switched to fast converging Cauchy sequences, and that's okay. what they stuck with. So sort of the obvious solution isn't always the best one in. Uh, reverse math same in constructive mathematics i mean in a sense you're trying to do as much as possible with restricted resources mm -hmm. uh, and in constructive math they realize that their definition of continuous function is is wrong let's say i mean it's not doesn't allow for the most general development and yeah. this, this was shown by franka waldeck i guess a dutchman uh and could you send a link to that or just to his name? I can find him later and I'll put it yeah. in the podcast notes. Yeah. So, uh, Got so it. yeah. So the, the, the point, the point being, um, if you, if you want to develop as much math as possible with limited resources, you have to carefully choose your definitions. Yeah. And this is, yeah, we, the notion of injection doesn't work. We have to go to, uh, what we call height functions, but this goes back to Borel. In fact, we, we discovered today. Uh, so Borel already had this idea of height functions, and this are was... these height functions like in the sense of number theory, like the height of a rational number, or yeah, different? exactly, exactly. Okay. So uh, and they they go back to Borel, uh, and and the I mean the the very idea is that. Once you the the idea is that if you look at how countable sets occur in the wild, in in <laughs> mathematical practice, you never really get an injection. It's always height functions, which amounts to union over the naturals of finite sets. That is interesting. Huh. And so this this, is... but this is huh. this is sort of what what you have to have a feel for this to some extent in reverse math. So you. Yeah, sure. Countable sets are countable. Yeah, but how? There's many definitions of countable once you start looking into it. 
I mean, and even ZF cannot prove that a union of countable sets is countable. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's all stuff that you have to take into account. And so when, when we look at Fourier analysis, like functions of bounded variation and, and regulated functions, then you notice, ah, this is the right definition, height functions union over n of finite sets. And yeah, once you have that, then everything falls neatly into place and you have many equivalences. Yes. There's something I've always appreciated about math is how definitions over time, so much work goes into them. And in particular, some subtlety is noted in definition. And as they're refined, they also give an idea of the right way, or at least a more right way to think about things or what the right way even is supposed to look like. This may well depend on the field at hand, of course, or the purpose you are doing. But I do, I agree exactly with what you said. It's 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 like a testimony to Borel's genius that the guy already looked into this. And yeah, he, he looked at height functions for the... Uh, for the algebraic numbers and he did explicit computations there. And so, yeah, this is really neat stuff actually, but yeah, so it's actually, it's, it's to some extent, once you f get the definitions right, as I told you, everything falls out. Yeah. And then- there reminds me of something Michael Spivak said, the definition should be hard and the theorem's easy. <laughs> uh, if the definitions are too easy to to understand, it's probably you, you're you're not pushing your crowd or your your you're not pushing in the right direction. Let's say you're being lazy, as it were. I think part of the success of putting things into definitions rather than theorems. To give an analogy from computers, it's easier for people to reason about quite complicated data structures or objects than even relatively simple functions on them. Like say a few for loops and a couple of if statements on a tree can be quite difficult to understand compared to like a tree made of pointers where, where that people can easily lean on visual intuition. And so by pushing the complexity into the object side, because of her, most people's sort of inherent ten, ooh, I don't know what the word is, way of processing information, we derive some benefit from that. And I, I see a similarity in definitions in math. Yeah. Um, another, for example, um, even a more basic example. What's the right definition of finite set of reals? Oh my god! But just when you said finite set, this some definition that I have gone in so many directions on is the word. What does the word finite really mean? After learning about hyperfiniteness, threw me for a hell of a loop there even the word countable and showing that I think Hampkins has some result that in a larger model, something can look countable. I'm a novice in this area. So I'm just quoting him here. No, but this, this is, this is in a sense, the very idea of uh, behind forcing and the, like depending on, you can always step to a bigger or smaller model and things will look different in a way you have control over some things may be countable or uncountable or yeah that's uh i mean so there i should mention something perhaps so yeah. people have tried to uh sort of reprove our results using forcing mm -hmm. which, which is yeah a multi-million dollar industry in <laughs> in logic yes they failed and so our our results, our counter models, they are built using Kleene's recursion theory, which is a very different uh, construct. Uh, yeah, if you compare it to forcing, but somehow forcing can't do this stuff very well uh, for for reasons we don't understand. So is there is, yeah, it's, I mean, especially as I told you, it's not like I mean, there's there's just if you look at the names associated with forcing, like how many different kinds of forcing there are, you would think you can build models of higher order arithmetic with some precision. There are also set theories like that go down. Like if you like, um, Adrian Mathias has what he calls Providence set theory. And this is, uh, below ATR zero. I would like that. Yeah. Provident set theory. Okay. 
and this is below ATR zero. Uh, and this, ATR that's zero. where you can below ATR zero. And this is where you can still do forcing properly, let's say, like in the usual way. Uh, I mean, this should not be such a surprise. Like, um, not Rick Smith, uh, Rick Sommer looked at what do you need to do ordinal analysis. And this, like, if you go into the nitty gritty, ordinal analysis can be formalized in theories of bounded arithmetic. Okay. And so yeah. you don't even need the exponential function. You just need, well, essentially, what is what is your yeah, PNP and all that stuff. Uh, you need a weak system of bounded arithmetic, and there you can manipulate symbols. And this is yeah, formalizing ordinal analysis. It's a mess, obviously, but it can be mm -hmm. done. And so the the usual forcing business can be done in Matthias's uh, providence set theory. And so, I mean, coming back to my earlier point, it's yeah. surprising that somehow forcing can build good models of higher order arithmetic. I mean, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, may, maybe it can, people just haven't looked at it enough, but so far the only way is using, uh, yeah, Kleene's recursion in theory. This is a bit of a jump, but the thing about providence set theory made me think about alternate set theories. And there is one because of its connections to non-standard analysis that I wanted to ask you about, which is the non-well-founded set theories, like as a yeah. general class. Just thoughts, feelings. I don't have exactly a question here. Yeah, so I, I generally have I generally have sort of a how do you say? More than the average logician or mathematician, I have a certain respect uh, for alternative approaches, let's say. So yeah. this is what some people might call weird or, I mean, at least the, the, the motivating idea is something of a, yeah, grand ideas. The setup sometimes fails miserably. Uh, like there's, yeah, uh, but for example, like type theory is extremely heavy on the syntax. It's like these people eat dry syntax for breakfast. That doesn't mean that, I mean, I have great respect and do a I'm lot of I because I've been using the lean for programming language a lot recently. It uses Martin Loaf's type theory under the hood as a dependent type theory. And it also, as a programming language, is the greatest facility for syntactic abstraction I've ever seen, to the point that a problem-solving technique in the language is to write a parser to where the problem is already solved, then copy-paste that code, and it will just be compiled under the hood to some lean object. They use this to write uh, as if they're writing inline HTML for a web server, but it's really just being parsed into lean. And the point about eating syntax for breakfast is why I'm thinking of this. <laughs> At least there, there's documentation for it, unlike reality. But my God, there's so much. I'm more of a yeah, shape but, kind of guy than a word kind of guy, personally. But but so my, my point is more sort of the the syntax is, is very heavy. So an advantage of set theory is okay. that it sweeps all this stuff under the carpet when, when it's not necessary. The type theory, of course, wants to bring out all the nitty gritty stuff. And before sort of proof assistance can be mainstream, this has to be solved to some extent. Like if you want to talk real numbers, you shouldn't have to deal with their formalization. And this was also to some extent Fuvotsky's dream mm -hmm. that if you have univalence, you have various notions of the real numbers. And as soon as you can prove them equivalent, they're identical. I mean, that didn't work out as he had hoped, let's say. But so if if they can deal with these sort of problems to some extent, like you just have real numbers, like like doesn't matter what they are, they have some properties, you can manipulate them, then this stuff can get off the ground. But yeah, sort of the nitty gritty intentional Martin Luth type theory, I don't think many mathematicians want to deal with that, really. 
It's interesting you bring this up also, given the talk earlier about the sort of reverse mathematical program of shifting definitions around as well to bring out an aspect of something, let's say, where it would seem like, okay, the internal construction say, okay, the reals, like you had mentioned, once were just DD kind cuts, then became quickly converging Kochi sequences. And it seems like that's where they've stuck for now. We're right there. It looks like the internal representation actually does matter a lot. Um, it, well, yes and no. So, okay, if you have, if it look, it, it is more if you want to, the internal representation only matters if you want to look at, um, real analysis in weak systems like in the base theory, uh, or anything where you don't have the Turing jump, let's say. So, everything is computable or Okay. At least you don't have the Turing jump around. Maybe it's slightly non-computable, like you have weak Koenig's lemma. But so if everything has to be computable, then this matters. And so, so yeah, th therefore, in Martin Löw type theory, because everything has to be computable, it's a very prissy kind of thing. Um, but so most of the time, you would you you would just like to ignore it. Let's say. So you, you, you know the reels have certain properties. These properties yeah. are there. And, the and you just work with the list as usual. Exactly. But so this is something that, I mean, again, I, I, uh, I had a postdoc in Munich who formalized in Agda uh, the non-standard dialectic interpretation, uh, trying G Xu. So he, there's this... Uh, non-standard dialectic interpretation that goes from essentially Nelson's IST, the finite type part, to normal mathematics. So no non-standard stuff. Mm -hmm. And he formalized this in Agda. So I, I know something about this, but every time I sort of have tried to, all right, now I'll really look at it, I'll install it and work with it. It, it really like, dude, you can't work with this yet. So they, they first have to solve uh, usability is my, my so you they should it should work less like programming language more like mathematical language if they want people to adopt this it's fine for the purpose at hand i mean i've met for example i've met people who use cock as just another programming language yeah so cock is used to verify industrial standards yeah I'm and you have people who this and i've I have some background in verification. I used, I combined it with aut automated theorem proving and using neural networks to actually generate the theorems to prove and also the proofs of them. And my start was just reading Cock and Software Foundations by, I think it's by Benjamin Pierce. It's like the C++ of the theorem prover world. It's kind of a mess, and that's why my face wrinkled when you said that some people use it just as a programming language. That's a little horrifying. No, no, but like this guy, I, I asked him, like, do you know Brower? What about excluded middle? I have no idea. They pay me to verify this stuff, and that's what I do. And he's, yeah, but you know, you can't do this or that. Yeah, but that's not so, like, I mean, obviously in a programming language, you, you can't just decide real equality and all that jazz, so... The, the guy wasn't very, yeah, it was just, yeah, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's its own idiosyncratic thing, but. I think this is actually why ones. MathLib has been successful in lean. Like, like, did you see the news? Like, I think it was like late November, December when Terry Tao used lean for the polynomial Freiman Ruza conjecture. I might've mangled their names there. It was formalized in lean anyway. In the main library of Lean is called MathLib, which is well called yeah. Math, and that one it does not use constructive logic. They made a choice in the very beginning to just go with classical stuff, making every basically the whole library is not actually computable. But because it's for mathematicians who care about the theorems, they don't care. And this seems to have been quite successful for them. It certainly picked up a lot of adoption in the last year. Probably because both Schulze and Tau have used it. Yeah, I was going to say here in Germany, we have 
uh, yeah, the young fields medalist who has been very, uh, yeah, he's been pushing this stuff too, in a sense, yeah. Watching its development has been interesting also to see people embracing, especially in the analysis side. The algebra side of MathLib is pretty well filled out considering it can formalize what a perfectoid space is. So it's very capable of commutative algebra, certainly better than I am at it. The analysis side has been much slower to pick up. I think a current project is to do <coughs> sphere eversion. Right, 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 right. Most definitions, for example, like say of think of compactness, the definition is given in terms of ultra filters and their convergence and not the usual open cover thing. Oof. They just like ultra filters appear quite prominently in MathLib actually. Without it, you would not really be able to follow the analysis, not fully. I see. I mean, I, I would I've I've looked at sort of yeah convergence of nets, which is essentially yeah an equivalent way of talking about filter convergence, mm -hmm. and this is this is already non-trivial. So, so for example, Samson Abramsky always describes uh, he has this nice description of uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Like at one point, you feel the sands shifting beneath your feet because you go from uh, the formula to the natural number denoting the formula and again to the formula so you sort mm -hmm. of this is sort of an, i mean this is a fixed point so that's what you do right but um so this is i, I always get the same feeling when i work with uh yeah, net convergence or yeah, filter convergence because sure you have this huge index set mm -hmm. and yeah this index set has elements but you know it may contain the space that you're talking about or or even you just the the reals or your index set and then you talk about convergence in the reals and so at one point you go from oh this is a point in my index set i plug it in oh i get the same point uh, in my space like ah, <laughs> sort of this is the self-reference that ugh, makes my skin crawl that's an interesting way of putting it huh? I mean, it's it's not it's not evil or whatever, but it's just sort of like no, this no. is like this I, is I the, think I get it. But this is not just taking the derivative of the sign. This is something more fundamental. I'm thinking of what you had said: the feeling of sand shifting beneath your feet, like it shifts, and you have for a moment wonder if you're about to fall into a hole. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, or yeah, or that sort of like 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 like. Ooh, I, uh, this almost looks like this comes close to being uh, uh, inconsistent, let's say, but somehow it manages just to stop short. I remember that phrase. That's a good one. Stopping short just of being inconsistent. Well, it's it's to some extent like what, like like if you, if you look at computability. If things would be total, it would be completely uh, inconsistent because, yeah, any sort of uh, you you would just diagonalize. But because everything is partial, mm -hmm. that's not a problem, you know. The but if you could somehow make any diagonal construction total, yeah, you'd have a problem. Or you show that oh. the rules are uncountable. It actually made the diagonalization make more sense to me. So thanks for that. <laughs> it's uh no, but there's nothing there's nothing wrong per se with diagonalization. It's just that it's such a fundamental operation <laughs> that you sort of yeah, you, you get the as uh, falling into a whole so fundamental nice. that Lovair turned it into his fixed point theorem. Yeah, yeah, for exactly, for example. Uh I mean there there's as I said, there's other fixed points too, like as I mentioned, the one where you work with nets and then you sort of jump between the the index set and the space and mm -hmm. uh, at one point they yeah there's an element can be both in a sense so this is a fundamental idea in mathematics let's say as so some might say one of the very few that's a good here's a question what do you think are some of the other very few well, so so well. For example, um, if you take general enough Heine-Bodel compactness, you mm -hmm. can easily derive that the reals are uncountable. 
And so one is supposed to be a diagonal construction. The other one is not. So, yeah. Uh, what, what are other fundamental ideas? Compactness, of course. Yeah. Uh, Bayer category is another one. I have never actually understood the Bayer category theorem, as in, like, I've seen the statements, many of them, but I've never really got, what is it actually for? Like, what do you do with it? Where does it show up? Yeah, well, that's a good, so it's not, it's not a, such a thing in itself. If you, um, there's sort of like a cluster of things, like you have Bayer category and you have the pigeonhole principle for measure. So like if you have a union, a countable union of measure zero sets, mm -hmm. the end result is a measure zero set, mm -hmm. the union. Yeah. And so there, there's variations on this and they, all, they can all be treated with the same, uh, with the same proofs, more or less. This is, this is in my other big in reverse math paper. Uh, okay. One sec. So, uh, so what is what is the main uh, big in reverse math measuring category? So um, they're not too different, at least from the reverse math point of view. The proofs are variations on a theme. But so the main the main problem, the main point of bare category is sort of uh, um, you have these weird closed sets. Okay. Fat canter sets. Like you have a set, closed set. Mm -hmm. It has no interior, yet it has positive measure. Right, yeah. And to sort of, these are uh, unholy beasts. And to tame them, you need the bear category theorem. Because the bear category theorem says that you can't, this is a unique thing. You can't express the reals as a union of these things. Like if you, if you want to express the reals or an interval as a union of... Uh, of, of closed sets, one of them has to be, has to have non-empty interior. Like they're, the bare category theorem formulated in some ways, essentially says like the fat Cantor set is really different from everything else you know. That 70% makes sense. I think I got the idea, the specific details weaving it, still working those out. So, but this idea of excluding things like the fat canter set or rather distinguishing them more clearly, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. So that, that is, so it's, 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 it's like if, if those things wouldn't exist, analysis would have been finished a hundred years ago. <laughs> Unfortunately, you have them. And yeah, of course, they, they keep making life difficult or even more difficult as you, as things become more abstract. when you said more abstract, I was just thinking of the whole program of tame geometry and the growth index program. And also that I think O minimal models are some candidate for it. Cause I'm at Berkeley and one of my old professors is Tom Scanlon, the model yeah. theorist. Funny guy, great bow ties too. But anyway, he would talk a little bit about mo o <laughs> I had I think I just always see him indoors. He's never wearing the hat. Oh, that's all right, all right. But anyway, he would talk about old minimality every now and then. And recently I asked him, because of a more abstract notion, one notion in non-standard analysis, because so many of them have nice, nicer variations. Like the definition of compactness and non-standard analysis, every point is near standard is one of my personal favorites. It's so beautiful. It's yeah. so satisfying. And it, through that, I was able to prove the Heine Borel theorem in both directions, basically trivially having tried and failed to prove it from scratch myself the normal way. So it's, um, it's a very powerful and simple idea also because the types are one level lower. So yeah. if you if you otherwise you have open covers which are at the very least a mapping from reels to reels or something or sets of reels, whereas uh, in in the non-standard thing it's just uh, yeah reels, standard reels and yeah infinitesimal you just proximity. Point, yeah, yeah. So so yeah, it's it's 
it's a much simpler idea. And this is why, in principle, non-standard analysis could be much simpler to explain to people um, because you don't have to go with open covers and all that or, or uh, mappings from reels to reels. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, yeah, I mean, Kiesler, Kiesler, Kiesler's course uh, used to be, I mean, so, so Kiesler used to teach this course and people looked at this and yeah, they did some sociology or whatever and people really understood it better. Okay. Uh, I mean, what's the result of this sociology outcome? Um, then also, there used to be, I mean, he's going to retire soon, but I mean, I stated this publicly, so Stefan Lemp, when he when he got to Wisconsin, he continued Kiesler's uh, teaching Kiesler's course, mm -hmm. and so he's he's a, he's a hardcore recursion theorist. So yeah, and he claimed, well, I, he got the feeling that students got it better with Kiesler's book, but yeah, it's not meant to be, I guess. I've had much more success with this, basically by restricting to a smaller audience, which is essentially various very smart, like 19 year olds that come through Berkeley, not as undergrads. No, for like AI programs, Bay right. Area, man. It's just, it's a different world here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They, it's like preaching the gospel, I swear to God, it's so easy. They're in exactly the right phase for it. And they don't really care about how the mainstream of math is taught because they're not planning to go through the mainstream anyway, because often they have some very specific goal in mind you, usually with regard to working in AI in some way. And so they're more than happy to take idiosyncratic approaches as long as there's a couple of textbooks. So I've gotten a yeah. lot of mileage out of Kiesler and then if they're ready for it, Goldblatt. Yeah, exactly. So I wish I mean, Goldblatt had pictures though. A, a large parts of physics run on all this stuff, you know? I mean, on the informal infinitesimal calculus, but I mean, so when I was uh, starting university, Math and physics were taught, I mean, Ghent, Belgium, math and physics were taught together for the first two years. So the math okay. students got a lot of physics. I mean, theoretical physics mostly, right? Like I'm still, uh, every day I, I'm surprised somehow how my, my, I mean, how theoretical my knowledge of physics is. But, um, and the, the physicists were exposed to some level of rigor they of course then would renounce uh upon yeah. grad but so the, the point the point being uh one learns these both things and yeah these these, these then yeah as a as a ta and and grad student you teach these people and then you really realize it's like yeah you know but dude this formula is easy to prove you know let dx be a very small number and then this and that and up and look yeah here who needs the 100 pages of calculus? We just uh, proved the fundamental theorem of calculus, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> it's, yeah. Uh, what, what can one say then? You know, it's like, is this, uh, is this wrong? Is this sort of right? Yeah. I've seen, there's a couple of papers I've seen where if non-standard analysis was used, I think its main thing would be, the paper would be exactly the same, except all the quotes around words like infinitely big and infinitesimal would just be deleted. <laughs> Yeah, and there's like, exactly. I think there's a real value. Like this point you brought up is interesting because in the more modern divorce between math and physics, physics has been pretty good for math. Math, well, there's books on how it's not been so good for physics, like Lope Lost and Math by Sabine Hossenfelder and others. Not going to get into that today, maybe ever. But like the role of rigor here, where when is rigor useful to? well, other fields by providing proper guardrails and also guidelines? Well, so generally, physicists know when to sort of like, I mean, they would sort of sweep most of the math details under the carpet because they have a feeling when this is okay and when this is uh, perhaps dodgy. But so... They would usually see, oh, look here, this doesn't matter. Da, 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 let's just run over it quickly. They can recognize, oh, but here, like when, like, like a high velocity object strikes a target there at that point. Yeah, there you can't just wish away the mathematical details. There you have to be very careful, very precise. 
So they know, in a sense, like, it's sort of like numerical analysis. Mm -hmm. they, they know when to be prissy and when it's, yeah, all right, all right, come on, let's do this. So they have a feeling for this. And I mean, this is also how you actually get somewhere because if you had to write down everything in minute detail, I mean, yeah, half yeah. of the time it doesn't even exist. Like I, I remember also as a grad student, we would have lunch with the physicists and they would have their grand, oh yeah, and then we break out the Feynman path integral and then we calculate and the phase space this. And then many years later, I realized this is all talk. There is no such thing as a Feynman path integral really. And it's just a bunch of computation techniques that they know how to use. <laughs> that and it's more a motif than an object. At least no, currently. no, there, there is like um, there the gauge integral mm -hmm. to uh, yeah, to, to talk about another field that hasn't exactly taken off. The gauge integral is essentially the Riemann integral where instead of the fixed delta, delta can be a function. Mm -hmm. And this gives you a generalization of the Lebesgue integral. Most negative descriptions of it are wrong. Uh, it's actually quite elegant. Multidimensional isn't easy, but not many people have worked on this. So the idea is that the gauge integral can at least formalize basic aspects of the Feynman path integral. Uh -huh. And well, there it has it does have uh, some good features. I mean, it's easy to to recover the Lebesgue integral as a special case. And um, so it's one of the few solutions where if you do physics, time uh, is not imaginary. I mean, so, so time is not measured by- <laughs> Unless you do Wick rotation, but I get your point. <laughs> you know, but the, 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 there is an arrow of time, or at least we perceive an arrow of time. And if, if your computational methods involved that the time is given by complex numbers while well, you have a bit of a problem and so the, the gauge integral as far as i know is the only way that you can formalize path integral and all that to some extent and uh will downey exactly but he's retired so he's written a book about this which unfortunately was hard to publish i mean yeah let's not get into publishers being evil either but uh I yeah I just think that for the overwhelming majority of math books in particular, because so few people will read them and you will, like for any topic more advanced than, I don't know, I'm going to be generous and say group theory, but really calculus, your audience has fallen off a cliff of people who will ever read it or want to. And so the reason you write a book shouldn't be for the money because that's kind of silly because you're gonna put so much time no, no, no. into it's, it. No, no, it's not. It's not. It's not about. It's not about money. But no, no, this is definitely not about money. But I've I've heard too many stories of, ah, uh, and then they messed up my tech code somehow, and I just gave up. What does the publisher provide in the modern days, like proper editing? Well, apparently not that proper in some cases. Oh no! Like like sometimes it's a disaster. I, I mean, it recently has gotten better again. So maybe they got their quality assurance. But it's like so, sometimes it's really like who who like like you can tell that nobody who who knows basic math has looked at this because they should have seen that this is yeah terrible. Yeah, I'm thinking, especially for more advanced books, like say a book on recursion theory. Since I doubt they keep a recursion theorist on retainer, just having no, others no, but, review it as usual, but then not even bothering to do that much, you're saying? It's it's more sort of like I've I've had, so in, in my brief academic career, I've had like, say, three or four papers where, where they somehow you you get the page proofs and you really think like, like, did they, what, what happened here? You know, how can this, how can this be? And if that happens to a book you've been working on for, say, a decade, yeah. I mean, for some people, that's enough to toss in the towel, you know. Like, I, I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not saying they they have to keep a recursion theorist handy, but sort of like at least somebody who is who knows this is what math is supposed to look like. Okay, I think I have a better sense of what you meant. Yeah, I agree with that. Like being able to do at least a basic quality check. Yeah, I mean, uh, 
Mm-hmm. Like, like, for example, I mean, in, in at least one case, somehow, like, one of the great things about LaTeX is that LaTeX just puts the math where it thinks it's optimal. Mm-hmm. And that's is not always perfect, but it's pretty good. Yeah. But then somehow one paper, one one page, one set of page proofs, it was just yeah, it was terrible. Like I, I got the feeling that they were sort of trying to, oh no, 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 late, we're going to tell you where you're gonna put it because it's our uh it's our journal style. Uh-huh. And that was such a mess that I mean I, I could I would get really de- if if I would spend a lot of time writing a book, I would really be demotivated, like, oh no, seriously. I found trying to force a piece of tech to render in a specific place. Sometimes it the software doesn't like that. And it just no, causes no. A, a chain of problems. Usually when you're trying to force stuff in late tech, that's not a good idea. I mean. Yeah. I mean, like like putting putting a a figure somewhere on a fixed spot that's okay let's say but mm-hmm. oh damn i <laughs> i had remembered i'd had a question when we got into the discussion about compactness which ended up here which was different basic topological notion of connectedness i have yet to see non-standard analysis contribute anything to the definition of connectedness here and also because of the well totally disconnected nature of the hyperreals yeah it had me really rethink connectedness stanlin said that people talk about definable connectedness these days and i mean it's 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 not that every mathematical notion has to have a simpler non-standard formulation. No, but it's a fun game to play. Yeah, obviously, obviously, but I mean, continuity, compactness, these are the obvious ones, but I mean, and, and yeah, in, in integrals and all that, but so the, I've, I've, I've yet to see a elegant equivalent formulation of non-countability. So, of not being countable or being uncountable. So say, for example, the unit interval is not countable. There's no injection from the unit interval to the naturals. Mm-hmm. How formulate that in terms of you know, non-standard analysis? Let's say just reals and infinitesimal proximity because that's what you do with compactness. I mean, reals, standardness, and infinitesimal proximity. But somehow, yeah, I haven't been able to figure out a nice one there. Um, if you look at uh, what's the theorem called again? So, for example, the uh, is it the stone? No, no, no. It's the the sto- the stone Weierstrass theorem. The approximation one. Yeah, exactly. There, if you have the non-standard uh, definitions and you manipulate them, then the definitions they use both in constructive math and reverse math just fall out. So, so even even a fairly complicated theorem, you, you I mean you have the non-standard version that exists already, you have the constructive and the reverse math version. And yeah, one gives you the other and that that, that I found unexpected, for example. So uh, even in non-basic cases this is possible. But yeah, what's the yeah what what's the one for the accountability the reals or as you say, connectedness? Do you have a reference for the bit about the stone virus theorem? theorem? Uh, in in constructive math or in uh, reverse math or that using the non-standard definitions that you can get the versions from constructive and reverse math to fall out, or is this from the one of uh, the unreasonable effectiveness? Yeah, exactly. I think it's in the unreasonable effectiveness. Great title, by the way. I'm glad you... <laughs> I liked the double meaning. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, oh, those were the days. 
Anyway, like, the, I think uh, that was the first time I saw you actually. Well, like a video of you and just as good in person. Thank you. Uh, so now, well, so Dark and I realized that people don't really read our papers if they have non standard analysis in there. So for our third joint paper, we, I mean, the paper was like five pages longer, but we kicked out all the non standard analysis. And yeah, this got published in the Journal of Mathematical Logic, so it can't have been too shabby. But yeah, yeah it's just, yeah. Do you have an older version lying around that kept it before you cut all of it? Yeah, of course. Could you send us? So, yeah, of course, if you, if you like. Um, it's it's actually so. Let, let me let me. So what we've been doing actually, yeah. Jack Norman and I, all this reverse math stuff originally comes from non-standard analysis. So based on the following observation, so we know that uh, yeah there's non-standard analysis and one way to look at it is Nelson's IST so syntactic mm -hmm. uh, business and so we know that like in set theory people often prove like these two axioms are independent over a mm -hmm. uh, weaker set like the axiom of choice does not imply the continuum hypothesis I mean to, to come up with a silly example and mm -hmm. so in the case of non-standard analysis we know that standard part and transfer are independent and the same holds for fragments okay I knew. and so so if you go down to the very lowest level the standard part principle for the reals therefore doesn't follow from a lot of comprehension uh, from a lot of transfer so you can have a lot of transfer but you still can't prove the standard part principle for the reals like every uh every real in the unit interval is uh, infinitely close to a standard now then this observation you translate to uh, the world of normal mathematics and then you have a lot of because transfer translates to the comprehension axiom of you know, say second order or third order arithmetic a lot mm -hmm. of comprehension cannot prove Heine Borel theorem because yeah, standard part translates to Heine Borel. Oh, that was compactness. It's an assertion about the standardness or near standardness about everything. Yeah, exactly. And so this this with a fairly easy manipulation, you can translate this to uh, open cover compactness. Actually, what people call Cousin's lemma, technically. Uh, open cousin. Cousin yeah, is a French guy, uh, historical one of the first to prove. Compactness, Cousin's lemma, exactly. And uh, so, so that was the third paper by Dag Norman and myself. So, uh, yeah, standard part and transfer are independent, including fragments. If you remove all non standard analysis from that statement, you get you need a lot of comprehension to prove that Cousin's lemma or uncountable Heine Borel. And yeah, that's how we got, that, that's, that's the first result without non-standard analysis. And that people really liked, although the, the first two papers were in a sense even better, but yeah, the non-standard stuff, nobody likes. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, let me send you something because I think it'll make, let's see. I sent this to Mikhail Katz and he said he couldn't stop laughing. So... Uh, Misha. In fact, I'll briefly screen share so the audience may see this gem. Yeah. <laughs> Mostly the phrase, perhaps we could restructure all of mathematics in a way that makes it wrong. I have gotten that feeling more than once. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ah, yes, yes. So yeah, one of one of uh, Mikhail, uh, Misha's uh, favorite uh, things is uh, science, like Planck once supposedly said, 
physics advances one funeral at a time. Yeah. There is some truth to that. That's why it's funny. Because there is truth to <laughs> I say your mother, oh my, with loathing the fact of you. <laughs> oh my. That was what's oh, step no. number six? <laughs> yeah, SMBC is always funny, but yeah. the stage where it becomes obvious and inevitable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what can I say? And the last one gives me some reassurance, at least, that because the concept is simpler, we're just in the middle of stage five. And <laughs> well, decades of debate have happened, actually, basically since Robinson. And when did Bishop write that book review where he called it a debasement of meaning? Yeah. I mean, Bishop, you have to bear in mind, like, I mean, like, B Bishop got the bishop got a hard time too like he, he had this idea of making math constructive he could have gone less zealot for starters but he had this in a sense he had a grand plan and he did this huge tour of the u.s math department and then everybody essentially thought i mean it called him to his face like, like yeah i mean you've gone insane go away we don't know you anymore so i mean one could one could become bitter but less, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, Bishop shouldn't have said all these things. And also, this was Bishop at a given point in time. Like, it's not like afterwards, he actually warmed up. It's not up like he's to... nailed his position forever. No, no, no. He warmed up to type theory and he even started doing some of his formalization stuff himself. I mean, he was also, he wasn't a big fan of logic, but then realized, you know, maybe if you want to extend constructive math a lot more. Is maybe necessary, and so he did change his. I mean, uh, this this was Bishop at a difficult point. I, I imagine, let's say, again, he shouldn't have said that. But yeah, we there's many things. Bishop we is have actually done. how I found you in the first place ever, because it was like I'd been doing non-standard analysis for I don't know six months or so after getting into it, and I'd noted pretty quickly that. It had a very constructive flavor to it. That's of why, I, yeah, when you gave that quote, I think by Horst Oswald, of being locally constructive, which is a great phrase. Yeah, that you sort of take one ideal object basically on faith, like an H for a hyperfinite number or some epsilon, but then the argument proceeds basically discreetly. Yeah. Which was very it's... satisfying. Yeah. I'm... I mean, what can what can I say? Yay! Somebody read my paper. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's, that was it's, why it's uh... just very funny that for Bishop's commentary. Another thing I like about math is, as much as some one might dislike a topic or try to run away from it, sometimes you don't really get a choice, and the topic comes right back to you. In the case of Bishop, this one, well, it using it to derive a decent amount of his own results is very funny. Yeah, <laughs> what can I say? So it's and himself, um, he didn't want to do logic, and yet he did logic in the end. Uh, I mean, the, at least the man could admit he was wrong, or at least he he saw that. Oh, absolutely, he should do that's something. a great trait. Exactly. So uh, we we're discussing this uh, about uh, Leibniz, actually. But anyway, um, the. As a bishop, I mean, yeah, it it. So so all these people like Brauer, Brauer uh, Bishop, I mean Martin Luth, they they saw some sort of spark of of math being like the computational, uh, sort of a, a sort of this 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 veil or or dimension where you see how to do it computationally mm -hmm. and but somehow each time when they tried to yeah they, they got this thread and they tug it but then everything unravels into yeah this is not what i wanted Vovosky experienced the very same thing like uh i do think it, it can be done in a very uh in a very nice way but yeah we aren't there yet let's say gotta keep tugging
we've got some yeah. to do before we get there. Yeah, no, but but this will, I mean, it's sort of yeah, people get lost in 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 formalism, in syntax, in I mean, th this stuff is also necessary, but it you you shouldn't overdo this. Let's say. That's a skill in life, managing to dance between those two. Yeah, but so for example, like if you look at recursive math, if you if you like a friend and colleague of mine, he was saying, yeah, I mean coding, you know, because I mean in, in, if you want to study stuff with Turing machines, it all has to be you everything has to be coded like a real in the end, because uh, yeah, that's the only thing you can feed into the Oracle slot. Mm -hmm. So they try to in math write down the definition of last fatality and when this definition was exceeding two pages they thought mm, maybe we should be doing something else you know let's just give up yeah so some things yeah, this is an example of sort of runaway formalism like somehow computation in topology that's not going to be with turing machines you know we need something else maybe even Pliny's recursion theory isn't the right choice maybe uh, a student of the aforementioned stefan limp actually looked into this like maybe maybe clinic computability with atoms well chosen atoms well chosen ideal objects then in fact and work But we don't know yet. It's something I would like to try still. Yeah. Just think of other areas in math where, well, there are many areas of math where we're not there yet. The ones that look like they're on some sort of cusp. Nothing uh, coming to mind right now. If if you say topology, I mean you say a lot, but I'm yeah. I'm not talking about all of topology. It would be nice already to be able to do something. I mean, real analysis is the start. Like, there's this, there's this guy, uh, Dave L. Renfro, who is sort of, I mean, he's a mathematician gone software person, I guess. And he has this sort of vast uh, encyclopedia of uh, mathematics, like with, uh, yeah, this guy. If you ask a sort of a historical question on real analysis anywhere on the internet, this guy will answer it for you in incredible detail. So he seems to have read, or at least read translations of all the papers. Incredible detail. Oh, wow, these are. If, if you do reverse, helpful. He even wrote this down, so like, it's surprising how real analysis is everywhere, density mathematics. So once we get real <laughs> analysis going, in reverse math, the, the rest will fall. <laughs> Yeah, you were not kidding about this guy having some comprehensive explanations. Wow. And I, I remember For this example, question here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so, I mean, for for me, it's been extremely helpful. I mean, sometimes, I mean, I say, but at least four or five times, this guy just oh look. Ha oh, ha saved me like two months of work, you know? Oh, that's a good one. Good catch. Yeah, I know. I mean, uh, 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 if you know where to look. One second. Looking at, oh yeah, sorry. The ethernet is just a little. I'm plugging in a cable to get a better network connection. Right back. I'm just gonna grab yeah, ether, you know, the worst of Actually, you can, 
<laughs> Actually, you can keep talking. Consider. Oh yeah, you have. Yeah, I see. You have what your wireless. Yeah. Uh, and so Anil on the road suggested looking at uh, necessary and sufficient conditions for Riemann integrability, and uh -huh. uh, there's a lot of historical stuff there, of course. And then this 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 Dave Renfro guy, he was all, yeah, but look at this. This is an interesting paper. Fell out again. Yeah, uh, if you once you have the right setup. And yeah, that's there, there's a lot of this. There's a lot of this stuff in in these big in reverse math papers that I mentioned. Like, uh, if you have a function that's Riemann integrable, maybe it could could be bounded variation. Why not? And the integral is zero. And so, say it maps unit interval to the unit interval. Yeah. Then yeah, at least one point has to be, I mean, it's it's almost everywhere zero. So at least one point, the function has to be zero. Mm -hmm. And this at least one point version is actually equivalent to the uncountability of the reals. And so, yeah, this, this, of Oh, there you are again. Yeah, just cut out for a second. There. And so, I mean, any sort of uh, yeah, survey, historical overview, uh, or people who have this knowledge is, is extremely helpful in uh, yeah, my neck of the woods, let's say. Yeah. This is something that actually... Ironically, one thing about software and math that I like is the social aspect of it, of making such knowledge more linked and discoverable. It's always bothered me that mathematicians, aka us, have spent so much time on all this stuff and so much effort, and then dispensing it so others may benefit from it is a real uphill battle. Yeah. So... And this is more true in some fields than other. I mean, there's this uh, running gag almost like uh, the grad student in category theory being told off for trying to write down a proof of something because everybody knows it's folklore. It was proved in the 60s or the 70s in the Buffalo uh, category theory seminar. So, so for example, in, in math, uh, in, in logic, the like proof theory there was a there was or is a lot of folklore like like this is folklore that is folklore yeah sure that would be a good podcast just just dispensing one... folklore just have an expert on for each episode and just drill them yeah. for the folklore in their field i actually want to write that down that's not a bad idea i mean there, some fields are more uh fruitful in that regard than others of course but um like category theory is yeah unlimited source i imagine um, yeah, I mean, in, to some extent, constructive math and type theory, you had Bishop's unpublished papers who were sort of making the rounds. Uh, I mean, in, in, in philosophy and linguistics, you had Kripke and Kaplan, who's, uh, uh, I mean, in, in, in set theory, for example, I've heard people complain about, you know, those west coast set theorists who privately circulate their papers so they can milk it before they send it to us <laughs> poor east coast set theorists the cabal of set theorists conspiring is just very funny to me given that if you took everyone who could even possibly be involved in such conspiracy and put them in a room they would fit in a room probably 
West Coast to the East Coast. So what happened to the cabal, you know? <laughs> I like Shalaz's scheme of numbering. That's a guy who's quite on the opposite end. Maybe he's got a bunch yeah. of unpublished stuff that I don't know about, but the stuff he's published is certainly enough to keep you busy. Yeah, but it's more sort of in in to what extent do you sort of erase everything like uh, so some mathematicians make a point of writing an as terse as possible proof of a new result with no indication how you got there yeah that's sort of you know you're not doing the community a favor let's say especially nowadays with the archive and everything and in digital publishing it's not like one or two pages extra will hurt anybody you know yeah, I'm thinking of even just on an earlier level, just Rudin's basic analysis textbook, the the baby one, of how it had a very annoying tendency for what's allegedly an introductory book, mm -hmm. the of always taking the the divine proof, the one that if you knew the answer would be the proof you would give, which is infuriating. Yeah, I mean it's it's. As as a nice example of why you, uh, why you've maybe like like you were saying bear category. I mean, what is that anyway, right? Yeah. So, if you look at the bear category theorem and attendant lands, let's say, mm -hmm. the proofs are rather set theoretical and thus rather abstract, thus not so useful in reverse math always. Okay. And so in, now let me think, either I, either it was the, so in some, I, I think it was the Venezuelan math society. Mm -hmm. We so do, let, let me repeat that. So most of the bare category theorem proofs are set theory and abstract. Yeah. And not so useful. And so I found in some. I really think it was the Venezuelan Math Society. <laughs> Proof of bear that was yeah, more basic nonsense. So just some areas of math are naturally more abstract, but not necessarily. It just happens to be that way. Yeah, I'm just thinking of the, the power of abstraction of math as like the rough ranking of fields. But as you get deeper into them, that ranking becomes much more muddy, I've found personally. Yeah, it's not, it's not, I'm not saying it's an absolute thing, but I, I was surprised by this, let's say. I mean, if, if at the end you see these basic proofs, proofs which can be done using just arithmetical comprehension, mm -hmm. and then you know where you're coming from, namely from these abstract proofs where you, you didn't have a handle on at all. Your first two papers of this sequence with Dach, what were they about? Uh, but I, what I said, sort of translating proofs in non-standard analysis to proofs in computability theory. Okay, and vice versa. All right. Yeah. So, so we 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 found 
an interesting way of yeah, we have this proof in you know, all standard analysis the other way around too that was sort of the the idea of the first two papers mm -hmm. and yeah so it was sort of moving towards a general framework where you could interpret is a standard as sort of is computationally relevant so you you, you can do a non-standard proof and a non-standard statement. And it's only the standard stuff that will influence your final algorithm. Mm -hmm. So if you say there like is in a the sense that it would this also capture the things like infinitesimals being added and then thrown away at the end. Yeah. So, but, but the general idea being sort of, you have to, you, ultimately you have uh you ultimately, I mean, you 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 have an algorithm at the end, mm -hmm. and sort of the input variables are determined by the universal quantifiers over the standard objects and their types, and the mm -hmm. outputs are the things you claim to exist standardly. Yes, okay. and so, and so this is, I mean, similarly in in type theory, actually going back to Schwichtenberg's Minloch you you can i mean the problem is if you always if everything is computable everything has to be computed that's a huge drag so starting with Schwichtenberg and minlog i guess they had two kinds of quantifiers the constructive quantifier which means there exists constructively but another quantifier there exists classically so that's just ignored by uh yeah the term extraction algorithm Okay. And this is akin to what you do in object. The algorithm ignores it. If you say there's a... That's what we were trying to... Your voice just cut out. Hang on. All right, sorry. And so what we were trying no, to do is sort of, end. as I was saying, yeah. akin to yeah. proof assistance where you have sort of, hmm? so akin uh, to yeah, proof assistance where you have, oh, sorry. Uh, so akin to proof assistance where you have a kind of a computable existence, like this object exists, I have to compute it. And classical existence, like this object exists, I'm just going to ignore it. This mm -hmm. is essentially what goes on in non standard analysis, like, the the normal objects are ignored but if you say there exists a standard object ah i'll have to compute that one that will go as an output in my algorithm mm -hmm. and yeah okay. the universal ones are standard ones are the inputs yeah mm -hmm. uh, so for all standard and then standard things outputted is the ones that are computationally relevant Okay, and I see how it ties into the claim about these two kinds of existential quantifiers, the constructive yeah. and the so, so classical. That's sort of the stuff we were trying to do. I mean, we we, we were we succeeded in doing, but yeah. So, I mean, logicians have an interest in, in non-standard analysis that is more sort of, let's look at the exotic stuff. Now, there is, non-standard analysis has a certain way a more elementary, more basic way of doing mathematics. But this is not the stuff they're interested in somehow. They're more looking at, uh, let's look at exotic models or something like that. Or how much saturation and everything can we pack together? It's not that this is not useful, but it's just sort of, it, it sort of I confess that I, I confess that I personally use the hyper reels essentially by conflating them with the surreals in the sense of like, how big are they? How saturated are they? They're as saturated as I want them to be. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so you can get, you can get very far without satur without too much saturation, let's say, but uh, yeah, at one point you have to, so, so if, if you want to go to like Ito integral and all that, then this becomes the thing. And the, the the loop measure also seems to behave better if you have a lot of saturation. Mm -hmm. 
Is there a relation between the Loeb and Lebesgue measure? Well, the Loeb measure is vastly more general, of course. Uh, I need to find a good reference for, because I've been reading a few probability papers recently, in particular one by Yenning Sung called The New Understanding of Stochastic Independence, which is chapter eight in non-standard analysis for the working mathematician. So the, the, the loop measure doesn't always, that, that's sort of the idea you, yeah. Um, yeah, here, I mean, the, the like measure is an actual measure. measure. Yeah. The big measure is actual measure. Yeah, so the the and the loop measure is 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 a measure in the sense of non-standard analysis, let's say, but it does not have a standard counterpart. Is at least my understanding. I'm thinking just in simple cases, like even a trivial one of just integrating, say, over just a square. Well, then you're just doing a counting measure, of course. Yeah, so they, they, just the it's pretty much the Riemann integral that reduces, then. of course. But okay, that was my question. Basically, the sense of yeah. re useful reductions and the important special cases, like the ones that can actually be computed or thought about. Well, the Lebesgue integral isn't exactly computable, but fair enough. Well, it's it's it's. However, uh, this is something Dak and I, in our latest paper, have looked at. It's rather tame, actually. Like, if you if you would have say the Lebesgue measure on uh, on closed sets, let's say, and okay. you add pretty strong oracles, you don't get anything more. So let's like say the oracles function... don't actually give you anything, or what? Yeah, the, or the oracles give you, they, they, they don't go, you have an oracle like, say, the Turing jump functional or the hyper jump functional, and you you can compute certain things with those. And if you add the Lebesgue measure for, say, closed sets, nothing more can be computed. Okay, more basic question though. What is the Turing jump functional? Uh, it decides any arithmetical formula. Okay. Why is it called the jump? Because it yeah. just does the. It's like well, the, 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 Turing, the Turing jump can decide uh, sigma zero one formula. It can decide one uh, arithmetical quantifier. You have to, of course, repeat it. Uh, so to to yeah, uh, remove more okay. quantifiers. Exactly, but so in in higher recursion theory, at least cleaning recursion theory is just yeah, it's given as one uniform thing. Like arithmetical is just yeah, you always assume that anyway, almost. Okay, and you're saying given these, then the big measure on closed sets will not actually give you anything further. Exactly. So it's it's a very tame object, as Dach calls it. Exactly. Interesting. Okay, well, the counterpart question, if you add lobe measure, yeah, what do then, you get then, then you get everything in the kitchen sink, probably. <laughs> so the, okay. the lobe measure, I mean, but that, that would be uh, maybe, it would be difficult. Uh, I mean, you, you would have to, it may depend on the underlying logical system, of course, but yeah. In any case, it seems like the meta answer is reliably confident, much more powerful. Yeah. Going back definitely. to your comment about well, vastly more general and such. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think you have uh, what's his name? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's uh, going on eleven here, of course. Oh shit! Sorry. All right, I'll wrap it up then. Uh, we can continue for... if you if you have a lot more questions, we can continue this some other uh time. One more question just for today, which is 
Okay, you've written these. What are you working on currently? What are you excited about right now? Um, Feel free to pitch to anyone, uh, anyone who watches this, and also I will be telling my friends. So, um, this is something I I only briefly presented this at Oval Wolf mm -hmm. but so I mean, what what has been studied? I mean, the, the English language has this proverb, uh, "beating a dead horse" or trying to yeah. milk a stone or yeah and milk so a blood the, from a stone etc yeah uh, if you um if you look at the way continuity has been studied in logic well that goes fairly in the direction of dealing beating a dead horse let's say okay now unbeknownst to apparently everybody in logic there is such a thing as decompositions of continuity where continuity is proven to be equivalent to weak continuity A plus weak continuity B. Well, we continue split that notion into two. Yes, and, and there's like them to get the thing. Exactly on certain spaces on all spaces, and so uh, this uh, weak and generalized continuity has its own AMS code. This is not a fringe topic. Okay. And so you may wonder, of course, yeah, you have these, and these are dozens, if not hundreds of decompositions of continuity, like continuity is equivalent to graph continuity plus quasi continuity mm -hmm. for certain spaces. And uh, sure, now we know that computing the supremum of a continuous function on the unit interval is a very tame, a very weak uh, operation. Mm -hmm. So you can ask the question, yeah, how hard is this, the, the, the aforementioned uh, Turing jump functional can do this, for example. Mm -hmm. So th then the question is, yeah, how is this for these weak continuity notions? Okay. And so for most of them, it's just the same oracle. The Turing jump functional can do this. Even for the topological notions, there, there's many topological weak continuity notions. And most of the time, it's just, all right, I'll have my Turing jump sorted out, no problem. And there are, however, seven exceptional ones that if you combine these with the uh, Turing jump functional, you get full second order arithmetic. Why seven? That's those. That's as many I can find. Then the pay, okay. so I submitted this to a journal that had a fifteen page limit, and so uh, yeah. Then the then the fifteen pages were up. Mm. Okay. But so there's there's most of these weak continuity notions are equally tame as continuity, but mm -hmm. seven are extremely powerful in that yeah the supremum principle is just off the chart it gives you yeah full second order arithmetic. second order that is very surprising oh. and so um yeah i hope to hear from the referee very soon if he or she or they are listening i can almost guarantee they're not but i wish <laughs> Anyway, that was so. This is the stuff I'm working on now. Sort of, yeah. Sort of, it's it's almost too obvious. Why, why haven't people looked at this? Sometimes I wonder if it's like this general class of problem of something is obvious. Someone notices it, and then it's like, well, everyone else assuming it's obvious thought someone else would have worked on it. And then they just sort of keep passing the baton yeah. to each other, so no one actually breaks anything down. <laughs> yeah, but so, so, so like, yeah, you you would th think that's like, kind of problem. No, if it's obvious, so that means you can explain it to people, which is a real <laughs> well, advantage. I, I just tried. I hope I wasn't too unsuccessful. But anyway, so I should hit the sack soon, and okay. uh, yeah, we can. I mean, we can continue this conversation, or you can yeah see if you have. I, I guess you have some unpolished diamond to work with. Oh, you look like you scrubbed your face. It's got some polishing. <laughs> Thank you for All your right. time. Welcome. It was my pleasure.